thank you for joining uh, this session. Uh, we're really glad that you're here and that you've attended the event. Um, I tuned into a bit of the previous session and it seemed very interesting and it was very well chaired. So I'm going to attempt to be as efficient and helpful chair as the previous one. Um, we have a short session here, so you're going to hear from each of us only briefly for around three minutes and then we'll take some questions. Um, I think uh, it might just be worth a quick hello from each of our panellists um, before I go back to them um, in the same order to hear from them for three minutes. So Nina, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Sure, thanks Dan. So hello everybody, my name's Nina Hemmings, I'm a researcher at the Nuffield Trust and if you don't know we're an independent health and social care think tank. Um, and I've lost my list to remember which order we were going in, but I think Javid might have been next, I think. Uh, sure, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Javid Mia. I'm an assistant research officer in the research team at the Health Foundation. Uh, similar to Nuffield and Ina, we are also a think tank charity funder within healthcare service delivery and social care as well. And Anva? Yes, I'm Anwar Sergulov. I'm a senior research fellow at Bright Blue, and Bright Blue is a liberal conservative think tank. Fantastic. Um, and I should say I'm Dan Tomlinson, and I am an economist at the Resolution Foundation, um, and we are a think tank that focuses on the living standards of families on low to middle incomes. So in this session, which is running until five past five, um, we're thinking about policy and how we as uh, researchers and the organizations we work for seek to influence policy. Um, and so I hope that you can type your questions in um, to the chat and I will get to them when we've finished hearing from each of us. And also if you want to raise your hand we can and ask a question and be seen, I think by the room, by the virtual room, then do feel free to do that too. But I'm gonna hand it over to Nina to do a few minutes. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just explain a little bit about my background prior to joining the Full Trust and then talk you through um, some of the projects that I've worked on and some of the policy influencing that I've been lucky to be part of. So I guess first thing I should say I feel is that I feel really lucky to work at the Full Trust, particularly given the pandemic this last year. It's been definitely an energising time, you could say, to be working in health research. Um, Prior to joining, I studied social anthropology for my undergraduate degree and then did a master's in comparative social policy. But I should say, because I've noticed a question in the chat about what kind of degrees you might need, you don't necessarily need a master's, at least for the job that I have, which is a researcher. It was listed as a desirable criteria, but des no, definitely not um, necessary. Um, and after studying, I held a few different roles in the healthcare sector, which I can talk about later, if helpful. So at Nuffield Trust, basically, we try to improve the quality of health and social care in the UK, like Javed as well, um, by generating evidence and producing policy analysis to shape the political and public debate and also influence policy and practice. So I've worked on a number of different projects which span everything from general practice to innovation, workforce, social care um, and immigration. And one example I'd just like to share with you um, of, a policy, of a policy win is um, some work that actually uh, that I worked with the Health Foundation and King's Fund on. So two additional health think tanks um, on levers to um, boost the NHS workforce. So we came up with a proposal for a cost of living grant for student nurses set at around £5,000 per year um, after doing a bit of research around government's decision to remove the bursary for student nurses, which some of you might be aware of. Um, so the same year that we published that recommendation as part of a report, government did introduce it. So that's quite a big win for me because um, we've seen that following that decision, there's been a 30% increase in applications to student nursing this year on last year. So really positive, I think. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll let others speak for a while. So I hope that's helpful. That was great. It was uh, really good to hear. Um, thank you. Um, so over to Javid for a few minutes. 
Uh, I think I froze slightly when you asked the question. Can you repeat that, please? Just um, over to you to do a few um, a few thoughts. Uh, yeah, sure, thoughts. I mean, I can explain a bit about the Health Foundation. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I said broadly health service delivery and social care, but we have five teams which work along our strategic priorities, which are really broad in, in everything that they do. We have a real center looking at long-term sustainability of social care and the workforce areas. We have a data analytics team that looks at uh, all things data to do with health and social care, uh, tech and AI in the NHS. Uh, we have the Healthy Lives team, which look at social determinants of health, so not specifically health delivery, but more the wider determinants of health, so people's employment uh, status, income, where they live, the environment. We also have a policy team, which does more of the direct influencing, uh, producing recommendations and influencing health policy that way. And an improvement team, which works specifically with kind of clinicians, particularly in the NHS to improve services. So as an organization, we work quite, quite broadly. In terms of my team, we focus very much on the funding side. So we, we are also a funder, which makes us a bit distinct to some think tanks. So we fund a lot of research into those areas alongside those strategic priorities and commission evaluations in those areas. I think in terms, given the kind of work that I do working on those programs, I think my biggest win has been most recently, we funded 10 projects from a COVID-19 focus program. Uh, and we managed to get projects that are quite distinct looking at inequalities and some set areas that I don't think were covered or have been covered recently. Um, in terms of current research around the impact of COVID-19 on inequalities and people's health and, and services that way, in particular social care as well. So yeah, that's my biggest win. Um, and yeah, with the way that we influence in that sense is that we use the outputs, the findings and the research from the things we fund to then influence our policy work in the other, other teams and then directly with policymakers and decision makers and the wider research community too. Great, thank you. Um, and over to Anvar. Yes, uh, so I think I'll just very briefly cover my background and how I ended up in my, in my position. And then I'll discuss just a bit more about policy. So uh, I actually joined Bright Blue pretty much straight out after completing my master's. So I, finished, I did my undergrad, then did my master's immediately, and then went straight into as a research assistant. And I think as, as Nina said, you don't really need, you, like a master's is, or a PhD is helpful, but you don't need it as a necessity. Um, and I only had two months of like work experience as an intern at another think tank one summer beforehand. And I've been at Bright Blue for two years now, just staying there and progressing through the research roles. Um, I mean, in terms of policy, I think one thing I do want to highlight is that policy is very much, it's of course closely related to research because policy development, comes out quite significantly through researching both in terms of kind of the existing data and kind of previous attempts at policies, but it's also a very, it's it's also in, involves a lot of kind of communication, uh, a lot of the policy work that we've been doing. And one major policy wing that we've had is removing a seven day wait in the wait for the first payment for universal credit, which happened, which was removed a couple of years ago. Uh, but a, a lot of that work is not just about just the, the researching of the policy. A lot, a lot, a lot of it is communication. It's interacting with, for, for example, in case of the universal credit, interacting with people who are experts in policy in the third sector and getting their opinion and their views and getting their feedback in as we kind of think about um, as we think about what is plausible versus evidence based. It's also interacting with actually politicians uh, where possible, having conversations with them, finding people who are uh, for example, in, in the party, but, but in the current governing party, but in the backbenches to see whether there might be some interest or support and also go to what is kind of politically feasible and what's not politically feasible. And it's, and I think the other thing about policy development work is quite interesting uh, and, and quite tricky is that you have to have a lot, you have to think a bit about messaging too. So it's not just about, is this policy eff like effective, good or not? It's also about thinking about is, is this something that politicians can support? Is, is, is there an immediate short-term impact which makes it easier for politicians to adopt? Now, of course, there's lots of good policies which don't necessarily are politically easily sellable, but often when thinking about kind of how to address an issue, it's, it's worth thinking. It's, it's often we do take those 
things into consideration too. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out how kind of like quite interesting multidimensional the process in it is. And I think that's pretty much all I have time for. But I'll, I'll end there. That's great. You're all doing a very good job of keeping to time. So I have to try and do that too. Um, I'm just going to talk really briefly about one example um, of policy influencing that uh, has happened at the Resolution Foundation, which happened um, quite a while ago now, actually, in 2015, around the time I joined the organisation. My notes are on a different screen, so I'm going to look away a bit. Um, so we're a think tank that's focused on the living standards of families on low to middle incomes. And so that means we care about things like employment, pay, benefits, taxes, housing costs, those sorts of things. And we're also a quant focused think tank. So we do lots of research in spreadsheets and in data sets, trying to figure out what's going on in the world and explaining that to the public and to journalists and trying to influence the political debate that way. Uh, back in 2015, the government announced a large cut to tax credits, which are one of the key benefits for working families. And we knew that would have taken a lot of money away from low to middle income families, which are the group that we um, really care about. That's part of our charitable purpose is to support the living standards of these groups. Um, and so we got to work trying to figure out, A, how much money would it take away? And we found out on average £1,300 a year. B, how many people would be affected? And we found out 3.3 million families and see how would different groups be affected differently. So for example, we found that families with children would have a bigger cut, 2000 pounds on average for a couples, both couples where both the adults are working and they've got two children. And then we communicated this research and these facts in a variety of different publications and blogs that we tried to time um, well with other things that were going on like the Conservative Party conference. Um, we didn't, for example, start a trendy Twitter hashtag, though other campaigning and think tank organisations might have. We didn't spend a lot of time trying to get ourselves in the room with ministers to talk about these things, though lots of, again, other think tanks and research organisations might have different strategies and do that a bit more than, than, than RF. Uh, and we didn't tell the stories of uh, specific families, even though, um, again, other organisations, maybe like Child Poverty Action Group, would have done that. Um, we focused on the numbers and explaining the impact um, through doing good research that um, was trusted um, to be impartial and accurate by journalists and politicians and trying to influence the public debate with that speed and precision in our analysis. Um, and ultimately the Chancellor performed a U-turn and we think that it was in part due to the impact that we had in um, helping inform that debate so the cuts to tax credits didn't go ahead. So that's my example, and I hope that it's been interesting to hear from me and the other uh, three panellists. We're good and on time. We've got about seven or eight minutes left for some questions. Um, and there are so many here, which is fantastic. Um, I, um, I wondered whether, um, Nina, in a second, you might take Rosie's question, which is about what are some of the typical day-to-day -day tasks that someone working for policy in a think tank might do? Um, but before then, there's a couple of questions that I can rattle through very quickly. Um, so uh, people have asked about um, whether um, what people have done when they've straight come straight out straight out of university. So I worked for a student union for a year, and then I worked in the civil service for a year. And I think lots of people who worked in think tanks have um, have come from the civil service or from other sorts of policy related jobs so um, if you can't quite get into a think tank right from the start but you're interested in doing that then I think the civil service is um, a good way to go um, and there was another one that I thought I could answer quickly um, I was wondering if in order to become a researcher a PhD is required uh, someone has answered that and the answer is definitely not I have an undergraduate degree and that is all um, and I'm uh, in a think tank so uh, and I know lots of other people who work in think tanks who don't have um, PhDs so Nina did you, did you want to answer that question if there's any others that you've spotted that you wanted to answer quickly feel free to and then I might come back to uh, Anvar and you can maybe answer Adele's question about what can I do while I'm studying um, but we'll go over to Nina. Okay thanks Dan um, so I guess this question the answer you'd get slightly varies perhaps on whether you're say a policy researcher or your role is more policy and comms or just straight up research. So I do a little bit of both policy and research, which means that the types of things I do every day are things like 
everything from conducting literature reviews to uh, interviews as part of research projects, um, things like press statements ahead of the budget, or, or sorry, after the budget, or um, coming up with proposals um, ahead of big events like spending reviews. Um, so we work quite closely with our comms team, who I should say are really excellent at finding opportunities for us to engage and disseminate our work and our findings and recommendations. So activities around that would be things like potentially meeting with special advisors or ministers even in some cases, um, pulling together submissions for select committees um, in their evidence inquiries and Twitter monitoring. I love doing that. It's Twitter is such a great place for monitoring policy and politics. Um, and so, so it's a mix really. This is a very long answer. It's a mix of policy research and a bit of stakeholder engagement amongst other things. Um. I was on mute, great. Um, thank you for that answer. That was uh, really helpful. Um, uh, Amra, would you be able to take this question around um, what experience can I get while studying that will serve me when applying for roles in policy? What skills do you look for? Uh, yeah, um, I think in our perspective, I think a research, just general research skills are quite good just outside of your degree. So for example, I did an internship at another think tank for, for two months, but there's other kind of various opportunities. For, for example, we did, we had a, at our university, we had kind of like a policy forum, which I contributed to. So can I just kind of just adopting that research skills in a more kind of like think tank current context and also like at least for kind of more political think tanks, I think being quite familiar with kind of like current affairs is often a, a very useful thing, especially on the policy front. I mean, a lot of my, quite a bit of my entry level interviewing was actually about kind of like just checking how, how well understanding I was of, of the current situation and processes. Um, so I, I, th I think it, it's those two things really that are probably the key things. Thanks, Anvar. Um, and Javid, there's loads of questions here. I don't know if you spotted any that you particularly wanted to answer, or I can pick one for you. <laughs> um, I'm happy to let you pick. There is a lot. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, uh, Bandy has asked, um, would you need extremely strong research skills in a think tank, or would you say that you need a base level and then you can learn on the job? And then um, a similar sort of question, um, Maria has asked, what type of work experience would stand out on an application form, especially for graduates with limited experience? So that's about what your research skills and your experience before you are trying to apply for think tanks. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, full disclosure, I have a master's too, but that probably wasn't necessary for my kind of role. And I think with a lot of uh, research roles, undergraduate degree is absolutely fine uh, because you have a lot of transferable skills it's the way that you apply them uh, and you can discuss them so thinking about when you're applying for work uh, recently I help out to um, bring some of our interns in and it's the same thing it's how you discuss the skills and the experience that you have uh, that work best so in, in terms of those skills uh, before kind of or to go into research um, I mean I've always found the most the place where I've had the most skills, how I've discussed my skills and most is mainly from my experience from retail more than actually probably my degree when I was first getting in, because that taught me a lot, um, which I actually see I probably apply more in my role outside of specific research skills. So it's really um, when thinking about skills, it's how you apply them, how you discuss them and how they fit in. So I think in the way back in the first session, someone had a similar question. And yeah, you don't. Um, necessarily need to just talk about one thing or just about your degree experience. You have loads of different experiences from your life that you can discuss that apply to different content and it's just the way that you use them. Um, but yeah, your degree from, I think that's most people here, would have put you in good stead. So it's about how you can make those transfers if there's a specific area you want to be in. Great, and um, wow. We're out of time already, and there are millions of questions that we haven't managed to get to. Um, 
uh, but um, it's important that we keep time so you can um, you can go and have a little break before the next session. I'll just check with uh, my fellow panelists if there wasn't anything else that you, you think it would be really good to answer an area that I didn't cover that you want to cover. You're very welcome to come in. We can run over by another minute. Um, but if not, yeah, go on, Nina, go for it. I was just going to add, um, there are a few questions here about what it's like working at a think tank and how it differs to, say, academia. Um, this is a good plug for the Nuffield Trust Summit, which is our annual conference, and that's taking place soon. It's actually the first year that it's going to be publicly available online, so I'd encourage you all to sign up to get a flavour of some of the topics and ways of working that you might experience at a think tank. Um, and also, just to say, there are lots of questions here, and my email is on I think it's on the Nuffield Trust website and you're very welcome to contact me there if helpful. Yes, I also want to very quickly plug that we actually do kind of like weekly walk experience if you just need to kind of like sending a very basic CV uh, to us. So if you want to contact me, uh, my email again is on our website uh, then you can get a week's walk experience quite straightforwardly if, if you'd like to see what it's like to walk at a think tank. Fab. Um... And Javid, did you have any, if you have anything oh, to add to this, welcome right. um, In terms of the Health Foundation, we have internships that run across each of our teams. There's usually one or two positions across the year. I think we filled most, although there might be a few coming up this year. Um, but there's always opportunities available. Uh, uh, yeah, there's always opportunities. My email is unfortunately not on the website as yet. Um, but uh, I'm sure you can find it um, either by contacting the Health Foundation directly or I think they've been shared after this as well. Great, okay, thanks all. Um, so the next two sessions start at um, 5.15. 3A will cover policy and work opportunities outside of London, and 3B will cover communications and events, that's what I am told. Um, the link to join these sessions have been emailed over and they will be recorded, so you can watch uh, later if you can't make it. We didn't manage to get to I don't, think we might, I don't think we managed to get to more than 10% of your questions. So there's lots of unanswered ones there. Um, an FAQ document will be sent around after the webinar. And I'm sure that as many of the questions as we can possibly cover will be featured in that. Um, I hope this has been an interesting, uh, if, if all too brief session for you, um, but uh, we're gonna end it here. So goodbye. <laughs>